every dollar that you print becomes worth less than the one that was printed last. The entire banking system of the world is dependent on the dollar as a reserve currency. And at the same time, we're losing the value of its purchasing power every day. And it's been going on for more than a century. been doing a lot of deep analysis of what's been happening in banking and what's been happening in financial markets and uh, yeah very keen to chat with you about that in particular i've come across a recent presentation you've given anatomy of a bust banks go first and in that presentation you make the argument that, uh, well, we're in a panic, the panic of 2023. America's financial system is in danger of collapse. We're here to protect ourselves. Would you be able to take us through what leads you to this conclusion, Addison, please? And and also, perhaps maybe to begin with, what, a bit about your background. How'd you, you, I mean, you've had, a, as I mentioned, you've had deep experience of this. It, it sounds like you've been looking at these issues for decades. Could you? Can you tell us a bit about your story and, and how you come to this conclusion, this threat of collapse, please? Yeah, absolutely. I've been studying booms and busts for a long time, uh, since the mid-90s. This is literally the only work I've done in my adult life. Um, and just to do a shameless plug right at the beginning, I just published a book called The Demise of the Dollar, which looks at booms and busts as they pertain to uh, fiat currencies in the world. And the, the, the U.S. dollar is deeply connected to the Aussie dollar. And uh, I address some of that. And also, the dollar is a reserve currency of the world. So like even the Aussie banks or New Zealand or Japan or uh, European banks use, and China as well, which is a big part of the story, uh, use the dollar to store their wealth in. So there's there is a symbiotic uh, international connection between my currency and yours. And that's what uh, that's what I've been interested in for this particular book. But I've also been studying uh, booms and busts going all the way back to the famous ones like the tulip bubble and the Mississippi scheme from John Law uh, back in in the early 1700s. And then the South Sea bubble, which the bankers from... Uh, <laughs> From London just ripped off John Law's idea, and then they went bust too. So booms and busts are pretty common in in the financial cycle of uh, of our lives, and we're we have just gone through one, and that's what anatomy of, of a bust. Uh, it's just a special report we put out because it was uh, interesting to have our very own boom and bust happen right in front of our faces. It starts really in 2018 where a lot of people were using low interest rates um, that the Fed was uh, Fed had kept interest rates low to recover from the 2008 bust for such a long period of time that there's a, like a whole group of traders who grew up in a world where interest rates were at zero or less than that. And so money was free and they were speculating on all kinds of things. And one of the things they speculated on was cryptocurrencies in 2018 we had this massive bubble in in cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. and a lot of the banks that started failing in March of 2023, which we're still, uh, I maintain, we're still in that crunch. Um, and I'll explain why I think we're still in it and why we don't talk about it that much anymore. But um, a lot of the banks like Silicon Valley Bank grabbed the headlines when they went bust in 48 hours because they had invested all of the money they were getting from tech entrepreneurs. They had invested it in uh, treasuries and then the Fed started trying to battle interest rates and they didn't account. They didn't either believe the Fed or they didn't have any risk. There actually was no risk officer on the payroll at Silicon Valley Bank at the time. And they didn't realize what the impact of an aggressive rate uh, rate hike policy by the Fed 
was going to be. And that was happening simultaneously with uh, the collapse of FTX, which is the crypto uh, currency trading firm that a lot of uh, tech startups had their money uh, had their money, and so when they when they when FTX went bust, they had to pull their money out as fast as they could, or they just lost their money. And in the meantime, the startups were being also financed by uh, Silicon Valley Bank, notably, and uh, they needed their money back to keep their their startups going. So the, a conflux of different trends follow the theme of booms and busts that we've seen throughout history. So when when it was happening, I was like, oh my God, this is our very own. Like we could write about this. <laughs> it's 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 actually happening right in front of us. So um it's that's what the the special report is about is like how that actually happened. Um, and when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, it collapsed in 48 hours because all these people wanted to take their money out to cover their own losses in crypto. That was technically Wrong. what was happening. And they were just yanking their money out. And uh, even though as, you know, as credible bankers, we would look at um, the way that Silicon Valley had put their assets, they, more than uh, 50% of their assets were in treasuries, which are meant to be, uh, you know, the risk-free asset that banks should hold anyway. Um, but they didn't calculate for the um, rising interest rates from the Fed uh, to combat inflation. And then when there was a run on the bank, that's what we call it. It wasn't, I mean, it's uh, a modern day <laughs> extraction of digits, really. But um, when people started taking their money out, uh, Silicon Valley Bank had to sell their treasuries at a loss. And it it happened very quickly. No one thought that with the FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that was set up by the Treasury to like help small banks stay solvent, help depositors stay solvent. Nobody thought that can actually happen anymore. The FDIC was set up in the 30s to combat some of the forces that were going on in uh, the Great Depression. And then the Treasury itself gets together. They get all the Wall Street banks together, and they and they construct these bailout plans, like what they did for uh, First Republic. So those, all of those things happen, and they were grabbing the headlines uh, from March until like the beginning of May. Uh, but then our debt, uh, what we call the debt ceiling debate, I prefer to call it the debt default debate, <laughs> mm, yeah. over the headlines and and. Nobody's really paying attention to the banks anymore, but the the underlying issues of the Fed fighting uh, inflation and um, overcapitalization in treasuries is exists. It exists in uh, there's 36 banks in the U.S. that are still under uh, FDIC protection, watch, conservatorship, whatever you call it, and then there's a bunch of other banks that are borderline. If if what happened in March, where people start pulling started pulling their money out of banks as a sector in on Wall Street, then those banks are going to be in trouble too. There's a couple others that I've been keeping an eye on that that have me worried. PacWest was one of them, um, and they're just banks that are lending to more risky clients, and then depending on um, the depending on treasuries to to roll out their or to keep their um their investments safe and depending on how long the uh the fed uh keeps raising rates which i think they're going to raise them again because inflation is not under control it's not under under control here in the u.s it's not under control in australia i think australia was getting really aggressive recently weren't they well they've the, they increased rates more than people expected there was a surprise uh rate hike and now the the question is whether they will uh increase again we've got a reserve bank meeting next week uh this it's a bit unclear there's a lot of debate about what the bank will do everyone expects that they're going to have to increase at least one more time by the end of the year possibly two uh it, it all depends on what's happening with inflation we've got a monthly indicator that 
in on through the year terms has uh, has increased or it's worsened, but there's a debate about well, what yeah, you know, it's it's very noisy month to month, so it's difficult to read much much into that. We need to see what happens with the quarterly figure. They've been watching services inflation, so goods inflation has been coming down, but services inflation is uh, has been rising. So that's and now we've got a minimum wage hike of uh, oh you know six to eight percent or something, depending on the actual uh, whether you're right on the minimum or if you're on an award. So yeah, there are there, there are concerns about the future of inflation here. I'd like to ask you a question. Mm. Um, I spent some time in Australia, and also we had an office there for a while, so we were trying to manage our own finances there. Um, it's and it might just be a myopic point of view of my own because I am an American and the Federal Reserve is what it is. But when the Fed makes moves, often the Aussie Bank or like Japan or EU will follow like a month later. If, do you do you think that that's true? Because I I I I don't want to sound like an arrogant American, which I probably am, but. Um, but it yeah. always feels like the the Fed is sort of like the central bank to the world. Yeah, that's true. It's not automatic. It's not. It, it doesn't always happen. But certainly, one of the things that our central bank is conscious of is what happen. What's happening with the exchange rate? And if uh, if we keep it, if we keep our interest rates too low, then that leads to a depreciation of the the Australian dollar and you know that that's bad for inflation so we start importing inflation so that's something that they are conscious of and yeah so I, in in earlier when the fed started uh lifting was it like last march or march last year or yeah, it was about a year yeah a little over a year ago yeah yeah and so the first few uh rate moves increases by our central bank were pretty much in line with what the fed was doing uh, and i mean yeah my take on it and, and michael knox who's a commentator here and he's a, he's a morgan's financial chief economist i think he's one of the best market economists in australia that that was his view on it that you know but essentially copying the fed that they had the fed was moving so our our guys had to i mean we re, our our central bank really uh i don't know if asleep at the wheels the right way to uh phrase it but our first rate increase didn't happened until I think it was May last year. And so it was a couple of months after the Fed, the Bank of England had gone earlier, I think. Reserve Bank of New Zealand really uh, got onto it early. But yeah, I think our central bank just wasn't concerned enough about the risk of inflation. They were too much in that secular stagnation uh, paradigm that they had uh, prior to the pandemic and those that that decade or so, they thought, oh well, we're in this world of uh, permanently lower interest rates, and there's no no concern about inflation. We don't have to worry about that anymore, for various reasons. I mean, that's literally what caught some of these regional banks uh, asleep at the wheel. Was the Fed got really aggressive quick, quickly, and even in the books that I've been writing. So I have this one, but I'm also looking at um, another one that's kind of like that. Uh, political analysis of how we got to a position where we have $31 trillion in debt, which is just ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. So um, looking at the trajectory of Fed policy from really from 1987, when uh, when there was a stock market crash and Greenspan had, Alan Greenspan had just become our Fed chair, he dropped rates as a response so that people could get free money and uh, and uh, prop up their balance sheets. That has been the response uh, since 1987 until now. And uh, no one, I like, they caught a lot of banks uh, sleeping when they started raising rates as aggressively as they did, and they were afraid of a 1980-81 scenario where inflation would just get out of control. There's no anchor to the dollar, and everything is based on the the dollar index, which is a basket of currencies, in, including the Aussie dollar, that that determines what the value is. Um, there is there is a ton. It's just astounding to me, actually, with all the history that we have with banking and 
and even the Federal Reserve since 1913, like the, the, there could be bankers who still have jobs <laughs> that didn't right. recognize what was going to happen. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, I mean, it's an but they they play an important role in the economy. But yes, there there are a lot of uh, a lot, there's a lot of monetary mischief or there are a lot of mistakes that are, are made for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I I like to ask Addison about. Uh, I and mean, a few things I want to I want to cover off on. Uh, you mentioned that this started in was it 2018? So you think this started before the pandemic? Is that right? And then the pandemic, all the policies during the pandemic made it worse or contributed to the instability. Is that what? Yeah. You're... What I would say though is that there were separate events. I think that the policies really started in about 2012 when we were in QE2, meaning that the Fed was still buying bonds in the market or in even actually buying up mortgage backed securities in response to um what the federal uh, what the uh what caused the the crash in 2008 which was a global event also because all the big pension funds and the hedge funds they're all interconnected globally so when when we ran into our housing crisis in 2008 uh, it affected everyone, and we we saw the ripple effect really quickly. And what the Fed did to um, to head that off was they dropped interest rates. We had zero to negative interest rate, real interest rates for a number of years between 2012 and and 2018. But they were also buying up um, assets in the market. They were buying up bonds in the Treasury market to support. Uh, bonds because they needed to fund the government. Um, and then they were also buying, they were actually buying assets on Wall Street, which is like, that's an extreme measure. The bank is not supposed to be buying assets to pop up the market, mm. but they were doing it anyway. So there was a period of time where we had zero, I mean, money was free. And there was the, um, I like, uh, uh, I like to phrase the, the uncertain uh, lender of last resort. That's what they call the Federal Reserve. You never know what they're going to do, but in the end, they'll come in and bail out. You know, they if they had to, they'd bail out J.P. Morgan, which has literally the fifth largest GDP of any economy in the world, and it's a private bank. <laughs> I was just thinking that on that point about how uh, this, uh, what was it, the unexpected uh, lender of last resort. Lender, how did you- he wrote an, an entire book about um, there needs to be a lender of last resort, but it has to be uncertain. You can't count on them. You just have to know that they're there in case the shit hits a fan. Yeah. And, and that's what the Fed has been trying to do. But what they've been telegraphing, what they telegraphed from 2012 until 2018 was we're going to keep rates low and we're going to keep buying assets to keep the market propped up. And the, the beneficiaries of that policy are Wall Street banks, big ones. You know, yeah. Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, those companies, those those corporations were beneficiaries of just an extended period of ridiculous monetary policy. And a whole generation of bankers grew up in that in the environment where they believed that that money was just going to be free forever. So when the Fed turned turned around and started trying to combat inflation, then we started having a serious problem. And the first people that got taken out were the regional banks who weren't paying attention to risk policy at all. <laughs> and so that's why I say it started in, in 2018, because there was a big boom in uh, cryptocurrency. Stable coins were coming out. Uh, Bitcoin had already like fluctuated up to sixty thousand and then dropped, and like it was already an object of speculation. And Ethereum was sort of like its step cousin, you know, it was doing its thing. But there was a lot of money getting pushed into the market because of low interest rates that uh, that tech firms and Wall Street banks alike, and new new banks uh, like the FTX um, exchange that, that was built, they, they, that was only founded in 2017. Like It became one of the largest traders of actual money, uh, dollars to cryptocurrency in like under two years. 
there was a lot of money flowing into the system. And um, that's when, if you follow Austrian economics, like, like I, I do, but a lot of other people do too. I'm not laying any kind of claim to it, but all the mistakes that are made get, they happen in the boom when there's money, it's cheap credit and people are spending money on things that they don't understand. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what, tech entrepreneurs especially were doing because they were excited about this new money that we could trade that wasn't traceable. And uh, and then banks grew up around it. The Silvergate was one. Silicon Valley Bank was another. First Republic was another. PacWest was involved. And so when the, the tech entrepreneurs started getting nervous about their uh, their investments or even their own companies, uh, they wanted to remove the money from banks. And I sort of targeting Silicon Valley Bank specifically because they were getting a lot of deposits and they didn't have to loan out money to make money. So they were buying treasuries. And then when um, when the Fed started tackling inflation, which itself, inflation itself was a result of 10 years of of low interest rates like we had of course we had the pandemic and then we had the war in ukraine which cut off some supply chains so created like pain points but at the same time there was so much money flowing around in the system that the natural outcome just in economic terms of that much money flowing into the system is that prices go up the the amount of money chasing goods uh, is more than what what the goods have in what I would call intrinsic value. So mm. it just costs more. If you want gas, it costs more. If you want eggs, eggs were a big deal in the yeah. U.S. I don't know if they were in, uh, in Australia, but they were a big deal for like two years because they went from like I don't know, an average of three bucks for 12 eggs to something like seven bucks. And people were like, what the hell? You know, <laughs> I need an egg a day. And yeah. now it costs three times as much. So that's that's the way that people feel inflation. But the cause of inflation, inflation is rising prices. But the cause of it is uh, money supply, money going in to the system. And they did that in reaction to the 2008 uh, housing crisis, they were pouring money into the system and making it cheap for years to a, a degree where uh, people just started thinking that was the new norm. But yeah. when Powell got in place and he started uh, raising rates, I mean, there's a lot of bankers, especially, who were like, well, he's not going to be that aggressive about it because this is the new norm. And it wasn't the new norm because you know there's they still don't have inflation controlled. So my guess is they're going to raise another quarter point and they meet again, um, and then that's going to ripple out to banks in Australia and Japan and uh, mostly those are the three that I look at: Australia, Japan, and uh, EU. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's quite uh, quite possible. I, I saw that the. U.S. Uh, you had a good was it a, a good jobs figure was was that what I saw? Uh, yeah. And so they're, they're saying the the economy is more robust than they expected, and so yeah, there could be still. Yeah, it's, mm. isn't it a conundrum a little bit that mm. uh, the Fed's job is to to make sure that less people have jobs? <laughs> yeah, like, well, that's and, the yeah, that's the Elizabeth Warren take. I mean, she was trying to. Uh, in, you know, really get stuck in a Jay Powell over that. I think in the in Congress, wasn't she? Or I'm trying to remember. Was it Powell or was it? Uh... Well, she was giving. Uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. She was giving a speech in front of Congress, but she was taking Jay Powell to task. Mm. So she wasn't actually even talking to him. But right. yeah. But that's just a weird thing that that the Fed's job has suddenly become to slow the economy down, make sure that more people are unemployed so that the government can then take care of them. It's like, it's it's not a free economy. Like we like to think that 
<laughs> America runs a free economy. We don't run a free economy at all. And their goal right now is to slow everything down. And then we, we, we got the jobs report that you're talking about. Mm. It was, uh, I believe it was yesterday or the day before. It was more robust than they, what they're expecting. So they're saying, oh, yeah, the economy is still growing. We got to raise rates more to slow it down. Like, if we got a jobs report that wasn't as positive as it was, then the stock market would have actually rallied. <laughs> right, but when the yeah. jobs report came yeah. out, it down because people are like, oh, that means they're going to raise rates again. We can't borrow money cheaply again. It's yeah. like, It's like pretzel logic to me. But it's kind of fun in a way to follow it because it's like it doesn't really make that much sense. Yeah, it's um, interesting but- how markets react. Yeah, it's just that we just had the situation where because we had this uh, surprise monthly inflation number and then we had the minimum wage uh, decision or the award wage decision yesterday, then the markets go, oh, that makes it more likely that the central bank here the reserve bank will increase the cash rate and so that and so what we're seeing now is that the dollar has uh uh appreciated against uh, the US so it was it was going down it was going down to below 65 cents US and now it's back up to around 66 <laughs> so one thing that I wanted to point out um because I think it's a, it's a concept that that a lot of people either have trouble with but i in this book i in this so i'm going to hold out the book again just because yeah. i think it's worth a read it's pretty short and my son helped me write it for millennials so it's like a quick read <laughs> <laughs> um but i was trying to wrap my head around how is it that the dollar can be the reserve currency of the world meaning it's the place where people other banks and like big corporations hold their asset mm-hmm. value and how can we have that at the same? That gives the United States uh, a massive amount of advantage globally when making trade deals and whatever, selling guns to go shoot Russians or whatever, whatever people want to do. Um, we can do that at the same time that we have inflation uh, glo- uh, domestically, because the there are there's a difference between the reserve currency of the world, which you know the central bank of australia is going to is going to make deals with the federal reserve like that is an exchange trade thing or if um i don't know if apple wants to open a plant in brisbane or something like those exchanges happen in us dollars and a lot of the commodities that uh, australia exports are priced in dollars gold and mm. like all the rare earths and copper like those things they're all priced in dollars so there's a, a, a tremendous advantage for the for the U.S. economy that we have the reserve currency of the world, but at the same time we have a payment currency, which is the stuff that we buy eggs in, or we uh, finance our homes, or or we take out loans to put our kids through school, whatever. That you can have massive inflation in that at the same time that the stability of the reserve currency. You know, you were talking about a penny between it yeah. used to be five, now it's sixty six. Right. Like it's Pretty pretty stable uh, globally, mm. but it's a freaking nightmare at home when they can't um, when they can't figure out how to slow prices down or the bizarre thing that we were just talking about. They want people to they they want the unemployment and the jobs number rate to go up. Like yeah. they actually want that to be the result of slowing the economy down. Yeah. I mean, they want a sustainable rate of economic growth. And I mean, you know, you want to avoid the overheating economy. You want to avoid the the, the huge boom and followed by the the big bust. Uh, and, and that's a concern. I mean, in, in Australia, what we've had, because particularly because in a combination of the massively generous uh, pandemic response, I mean, just like nothing that was just ever expected. And I mean, incredibly generous to uh, particularly to to small business people and also to uh, welfare recipients who had their, if you're on the job seek, you had that doubled uh, <laughs> compared with what it was before uh, for a, maybe six months to a year. And there's all this, and people were allowed to pull money out of their retirement savings, their superannuation, the compulsory super. And so there's all this extra money. And I mean, the boom we had was just incredible and unemployment nationally got down to three and a half percent and i mean i never thought it'd go below four uh like we 
we thought full employment in Australia was around or the natural, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment or natural rate of unemployment, we thought it was around 5%. And then suddenly it's got, the unemployment rates got down to 3.5%. Never thought we'd see it. Uh, in, the cutting off immigration was possibly part of that for a, a time. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do need to, I mean, the idea is to try and set the interest rate so that the economy doesn't be, get on. I mean, you know this, it doesn't end up in that boom bust cycle or the, or it's not as... Uh, amplified as it as it would be if you if yeah you, uh, so the my my issue with that is that they that's that was the idea of lowering interest rates for as long as they did is that they wanted to mitigate the boom bust cycle they wanted to use the tools that they had from history to figure out a way to mitigate the booms but also mitigate the busts they wanted to like level the whole thing mm-hmm. out and look what happened. It, it, you know, we had a pandemic, and then we had we had to throw a bunch of money at citizens, and then they saved it. The savings rate went higher than the credit rate at one point mm-hmm. in 2020. And then, as soon as the market, I mean, as soon as the economy started opening again, it plummeted all the way to lowest rates. We saw the the fastest rate of disposable income drop since 1933. It just went whoop whoop. Like they did anything but mitigate the business cycle. Mm. And in my view, I mean, I'm just a guy who studies and writes about it and talks about it, writes books about it, whatever. But in my view, why not just accept that the business cycle is a thing and not do anything about it? Let let credit go to the market price that is this, it's designed to go to. Don't have a central bank that is um, trying to manipulate uh, overnight rates so that their buddies on Wall Street can get, you know, can keep funding their projects and stuff. It it messes with the natural cycle of booms and busts. And it, that's what I honestly believe would, would do away with these kinds of uh, massive inflationary cycles that we go through. Or the opposite, which they're really afraid of, which is a deflationary period where they can't sell anything. And the economy mm. just falls apart. That's what happened in the 30s. I've been reading a lot recently about what's going on, what went on in the 30s. And that's when we got all these regulatory agencies. It's probably about the time that Australia started enacting its own uh, financial regulatory systems, too. Um, they don't help. And in fact, they're always late and they're always wrong. <laughs> so it's like they're not mitigating the business cycle. And they're not actually helping anyone um, be more uh, honest and truthful in the marketplace. It's it's politics and it's nastiness, and nothing actually like they're not achieving anything. And I'm I'm casting uh, casting a wide net here because I'm talking about regulatory agencies within the uh, the financial network, like. We've got the SEC, we've got the FTC, we've got the CFTC. There's a bunch of lawyers out there trying to stop people from doing anything under the guise that they can um, mitigate the boom and bust cycle. And that's just a natural order of things. That's capitalism. Let's let's go. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, look, I think there's I think some of the fine tuning they're doing, or if you if that's the right uh, term. Yeah, I think there's there is a concern that some of it may actually be contributing to the instability of the economy. I I I think that's right. What Bernanke would argue is that if he hadn't so if we go back to say 08, I mean he would argue and and you know Paulson and uh, Tim Geithner they would argue that if they hadn't done what they did or some variation of it, you could have had a rerun of the 1930s and you could have had unemployment of you know 20 percent or something or whatever you saw during the depression um i don't know to what extent that had occurred but that's what their argument would be um it, yeah it's a it, it's it's something i've been thinking about i mean i don't really know the answer myself i i am concerned like you that a lot of the actions that they've taken have contributed ultimately contributed in, to instability rather than uh, making things more stable yeah uh, well, yeah. let me go back to uh, Hyman Minsky, who was mm-hmm. writing in the 50s, and he was mostly 
describing what he read. He lived through the 30s. And then when he was an adult, he was a professor, I think at MIT. And he was talking about he, like his area of study was the 1930s. And he studied like Schumpeter and those guys who were writing during that time. Garrett Garrett's another one that I've been sort of fascinated with because as as we're moving through our own like situation, the the stuff that I read sounds like it was written yesterday, but it was written in like 1932 or whatever. Mm. So uh, Minsky's idea was the longer you have a period of stability, stability, it it's actually called the Minsky instability uh, theory. Yeah. That the longer you have periods of stability, the more mistakes get made and the inevitability of a crash is going to happen. So artificially creating periods of stability by lowering interest rates or by um, keeping them low for longer than the market demands or by incentivizing um, the couple of the things that we're talking about before 2018 were alternative uh, energy and uh, areas of the market that had been underserved by the regular stock market, they were passing uh, political motives or political policies that encouraged, uh, you know, like wind and, and uh, whatever. I, I wish they had gone into um, nuclear at that time, but they failed, they missed on that one. But there was a lot of money going into areas of the market that that weren't rewarded by uh, a return on equity. Mm. Like money that was put in was not rewarded, and so there was a shit ton of money going into areas of the market that didn't deserve it for a long period of time. And so the Minsky instability thesis is that when you do that for a long period of time, there's People make mistakes. They don't. They don't get punished by the market. That's a kind of a harsh way to say it. But they don't. They don't lose their money. They get rewarded for making bad mistakes that are based on policy. And if that goes on long enough, when you have to clean up the mess after that, which is what Powell has been trying to do, it's hard to figure out what Powell even thinks. But um, when you have to clean up the mess, then all of those. Uh, mistakes that were based on false premises, um, they come to light. And that, like, if you're watching anything of the financial news currently, that's each headline is about the mistakes that were made in like 2015 or 2018 or what the hell happened during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, we're still cleaning up that mess and we don't know a way forward other than. Uh, this debate of whether the Fed is going to lower either pause or lower rates again. Like that's the only tool they have. They Well, they have two tools. They have one, they can lower rates and then other central banks around the world will follow. Or they can uh, engage in another round of QE and support specific industries. Like I think we're going to see a heavy push either later this year or early next year to support ind industries that are um, trying to develop new technology for uh, cleaner energy, just because there's so much private equity going into that space right now yeah. that um, when they start losing money, as they have been, um, th there's going to be a push for government to step in and bail them up. Right. Okay. Even though, uh, I mean, you, you've just, you've narrowly averted a debt default, haven't you? And, they're going to have to have some cuts in discretionary spending. So yeah, I, I guess, yeah, maybe they'll find some way to do it, but the hey, let's, let's talk about the debt default for just a second. Yeah, it's yeah. so absurd. Like I'm like just a citizen of the United States. I grew up here. My dad yeah. was mildly conservative. I don't really give a shit about politics at all because I mostly think that they're talking out of one side of their mouths and then they're making deals behind doors somewhere else, right? So the idea that we have a debt ceiling came about because um, Congress used to have to justify all of their spending every year. They had to, once they passed the budget, they had to like stand up and say, we want to spend money on this highway to do this or this pipeline to do that or whatever. They had to justify it. But 
um, when we went into the very expensive wars that we've been involved in, World War I, World War II, Korean War, war on poverty, war on drugs, war in Vietnam, war in Afghanistan, that's our longest one. Like you can't justify spending that hasn't happened yet. So they put the debt ceiling in place in 1960 saying that, well, you can just spend money on whatever you want, but it can't go above this amount. And um, 78 times now, I think it's 79 now that they've just reached a new deal. They've had to raise the debt ceiling since 1960. <laughs> it's like yeah. the whole concept of a debt ceiling is just political theater. And it's not even a useful tool to anyone. It just makes people anxious. I actually started watching the market. I was like, when is this going to start impacting the market? May 18th. Nothing in the in the financial news, like the banking crisis, got wiped off the headlines, mm. uh, which I think is still sustaining right now. We're we're going to see more banks fail, and yeah. people other than the Nvidia boost that we got last week when uh, AI started grabbing every, all the tech people's uh, attention, the markets were just trending slower and slower, lower. Like they were just kind of trending down. And everybody was waiting for Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden to come to an agreement. That's all. I mean, it was like really boring. Mm -hmm. And all they were trying to do was to figure out how much they're going to pay their uh, the defense contractors, their buddies who make weapons to send to Ukraine. And that's literally all they were talking. Well, it was one other thing they were they were talking about is the Republicans wanted work requirements for food stamps. And the Democrats didn't want that. They just wanted people to get food stamps. And then there was a third one that was a pipeline from West Virginia to Virginia. And the Democratic Senator Manchin wanted it to go through. And the Democratic Senator from Virginia didn't want it to go through because his constituents, um, it was going to go through their farms and they didn't want it to go through their farms. <laughs> it's like the details that they were fighting over were minuscule compared to the 31.4 trillion dollar debt ceiling that they were arguing about it's all yeah. politics it's meaningless and it's it's a charade that comes up and they supposedly put a cap on it for two years but i'm i'm gonna guess they're gonna spend more than they agreed to uh and we'll be in this boat again next year or or in 2025 oh yeah because the you've still got the problem of the unsustainability a lot of, of the uh the automatic spending really the yeah oh the, yeah I mean, the, that, the, that wasn't yeah. even that was off the table from the beginning they're like yeah, yeah. of course we're pay social security and medicare and medicaid and all that we're going to pay that and that is uh adjusted according to the inflation rate mm. which earlier this year or late in 2022 it was nine percent so the, the adjustments were already baked in Mm. Yeah. So unless they're going to do something about that or, or uh, you know, the alternative is to, to actually increase uh, tax revenue, but no one wants to do that. And so if you're not going to do do that, then you do have to tackle uh, those entitlement programs. And again, you know, Donald Trump says, hey, I'm not going to touch them. And so the other GOP people, they're probably not going to do it, want to do anything yeah. about it. It's so. kind of ridiculous because one of two or actually both of two things need to happen. And I and I'm like libertarian. I don't I I'm not uh, I don't even vote. Mm. So for me to say this is like I'm just talking about the economics, not the political side of things. But they need to raise taxes, and they have to cut spending. There's no way out of this mm. any other way unless they can get a bunch of dumbass central banks from around the world to keep funding our debt by <laughs> buying bonds. Like that's it's just like. If if I tried to teach this to a you know a class of like third graders, they would be like, "Oh, that doesn't make sense. Like you can't spend more than you take in, and you have to borrow it from people who don't like you." <laughs> like, <laughs> it's pretty really obvious that it's unsustainable. Yeah, yeah. And yet we fool ourselves year or day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year that we can do this forever. Yeah, yeah. I better get uh, back on to 
banking because I want to ask you about where we're going there and this banking crisis. Uh, there are a couple of things I just wanted to, just quick things are uh, uh, be good to get your views on. So you mentioned that this uh, SVB didn't have a risk officer. Is that right? Which I find extraordinary. Um, is that yeah, a failure of regulation? Yeah, I only found it in passing. So there were two kind of uh, oversight uh, errors that took place. They didn't have a risk officer evaluating um, what the impact of rapidly rising interest rates would be on their the holdings that were like the core of the bank. That was one thing. And I think it was just in transition or something. There, there wasn't somebody in that position at the bank for like a year. And that was the year that the Fed started aggressively raising interest rates. And at the same time, um, no nobody in the bank thought that the Fed, actually pretty much nobody in the economy, <laughs> the big Wall Street banks didn't think that they would do it either, raise interest rates as aggressively as they did. So even while it was happening, people were like, oh, they're going to stop. And, so, and there was a lot of speculation mm -hmm. about when they were going to pause or when they were going to pivot. I remember back in, even before the banking crisis started, the, the big phrase in the headlines was, when is the Fed going to pivot? Meaning they're going to stop raising and they're going to turn around and start dropping. So, so the, among regional banks anyway, the first ones to, to kind of get under stress, um, they didn't have people that were taking the Fed seriously at the word. They, the Fed was saying we're gonna we're gonna fight inflation until it's done, which is a tough battle, uh, and nobody believed them. So when when the cost of treasuries went down and the interest rates went up, it was harder for a bank like I just used Silicon Valley Bank because it was so pronounced, but. Um, it was harder for them to raise the capital to pay back their depositors when they wanted their money back. And a lot of those depositors had just lost money in uh, the collapse of FTX. So it was yeah. sort of a direct boom and bust, you know, a line of, of crumbs from what was going on in the crypto market to what happened to the regional banks. And then you saw the entire banking sector get whacked in the market. Like there were other banks that were reasonably sound that were getting taken down because everyone was trying to get out of the banking sector. So when their stocks get are getting punished, uh, punished by uh, institutional investors and by pension funds, then that messes with their balance sheets as well. And the only reason we haven't been hearing about it in since I actually tried to pinpoint it, it was May 18th that the debt ceiling debate sort of took over the headlines. Mm. All of the issues with the banks still exist. Yeah. And my, this is that was really just a speculation on my part. But if they didn't, for some stupid reason, come to a political agreement on the debt ceiling, um, we would have seen a massive wipeout of banks because um, treasuries are supposed to be risk-free-ish. I mean, they're about as risk-free of, of an investment you can make other than maybe gold or precious metals. And banks had piled into uh, treasuries for so long because it was cheap and it was easy and it was risk-free. If we had a debt ceiling debate, I mean, uh, debt default, if the debate failed and we had a default, then treasuries would have been become an object of speculation like other assets in the market. People would be like, I'm betting they're going to do this. I'm going to bet that they're going to do that. And the risk-free part of that, uh, where you store your money, would have disappeared. That would have been a nightmare for a lot of smaller banks. And yeah. then the other thing that is kind of a nightmare, too, would be that J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, the big Wall Street firms would have just gobbled up all of the those uh, assets at pennies on the dollar, mm -hmm. which is exactly what they did with SVB and with um, First Republic. They just went in and they just took all the assets for like 
think it was three cents on the dollar for a first republic. Yeah. So can I ask, Addison, where are we going now? I mean, over the next six months or a year. So will this, uh, will we see more banks fail? Will we see a, a contagion or will we see impacts on the broader economy? Where do you think this is all going? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. I there is um, a, a certain level of confidence in the FTIC to like bank uh, to back individual depositors. So, like the fear of bank runs is probably abated a bit um, because the FTIC and Janet Yellen too, at the uh, Secretary of Treasury, she's been going out saying, "Oh." We're not going to bail everyone out, but if it gets bad, we'll bail some people out. Like she's being that lender of last resort. Mm. And, and so I think that the crisis part has abated, but that hasn't fixed any of the, um, the challenges that banks are facing right now with rising interest rates and the battle against inflation and the uncertainty of, of how committed uh, the Powell Fed is going to be to that. So it would, I'll, so that's why I say I'm going to answer it in two ways. One, I detailed all of this in a special report that we were talking about, anatomy yeah. of the uh, anatomy of a boss. This is exactly how it happens. And I actually got that phrase from Garrett Garrett, who was writing about how all the banks failed from uh, 1932 until about, they were still failing into the 50s. So they failed for a long time. But the three banks that failed in March into the early part of May were larger in capital by percentage than all 25 banks that failed in 1932. So like that doesn't happen by mistake. And that also doesn't happen without repercussions. And I expect that that we're going to be talking about the banking crisis like three years from now, because it, it hasn't worked itself out yet, and they're still trying to fight inflation. So, so I don't know if we'll have a a panic or a crisis period like we had between uh, the beginning of March and mid and mid May. Uh, but I think the tension is still there, and it's definitely something that we want to pay attention to because the banking system is the the bedrock for all of the other stuff that we do. Like when we buy and sell stocks, when we get mortgages, when we, you know, buy cars, send our kids to school and stuff like that, that system needs to be, uh, we need to have confidence in that system. And I don't think it's there yet. Right. We get a We get a paper version of the confidence from speeches from Janet Yellen and uh, you know, forgot her name already, but the one, the woman who runs uh, the FDIC. But like, I mean, it's just a fact. The FDIC has like 300, you know, they have $37 billion to support $17 trillion worth of deposits. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's absurd. Other than, I mean, and I've written this too. This is, a, it's a confidence game. Like, just like the way people, you know, take advantage of uh, retirees because they gain their confidence. The confidence gain is what it is. It's a it's a sham. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. now, the government is running a confidence. It's literally, people have confidence that the government will figure this out, and so they're they're just biding their time. And what are they going to do next? My my guess is they're going to drop interest rates as soon as there's like a real crisis. They'll drop interest rates, and they'll get. Uh, another speculative boom going on Wall Street, and usually, what happens when when that happens is that um, mutates into bubbles in other markets too. Like Australia always benefits from um, from booms in the commodities market, um, and China always benefits from new tech development, and the Europeans um, benefit from new speculation in travel and tourism. Like it's it's almost predictable what's going to happen next right okay so this is your report anatomy of a bust i can put a link in the show notes to that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and um just trying to think about yeah what the risks are i mean 
you make the case that yeah, more banks are probably going to fail. Uh, maybe we won't have a bank run. We won't have bank runs like the traditional bank run in uh, you know it's a wonderful life and uh, you see yeah, exactly. yeah um, maybe you won't see all that, digital but, now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but there could be bank runs, and then I mean presumably there'd be some economic. Uh, ramifications. What do you think the chances of something like 2008 happening again or something worse than that? What would you put the probability of that at in the next uh, couple of years? Right now, I'd say it's pretty low because um, one of the things that happens is like human beings, the, the people who run the government also learn. And they did what they thought they had to do in 2008. I, I've written about this many times that mm. uh, Paulson delivered a three page memorandum to Congress and said it at like midnight and said, you have to bail out these banks. Otherwise, the entire global economy is going to fall apart. It was three pages and they just followed it. So I think they've learned that um, through monetary policy and also working in concert with other federal, like the Federal Reserve System of the world, that they can mitigate. Um, crises, but that doesn't mean the problems aren't still there. So that's why it's important to understand how booms and busts even take place. You can't keep interest rates at zero for 10 years and then expect that no inflation is going to pop up. Like mm. it, It's ridiculous. But um, it's worth understanding um, the mechanisms behind the banks and whatnot, because that's the that's where the money flows. It, that's how the markets work. That's how you know they d- determine interest rates for all kinds of things, credit cards and and uh, student loans and banks and cars and all that kind of stuff. Like the the the, the economy functions on credit, mm-hmm. and banks are the source of that credit. And they're all connected to the Federal Reserve System. So it's worth paying attention to what they say. And, and I hate that. I I don't like politics and I don't like the banking system. But I warn people that they ignore those things at their peril. Because when you need to do something financially in your lives, you're sort of dependent on decisions made by people who live far away from you and don't have your interests in mind. Yeah, yeah. I just want to try to understand what this all means. So does does this mean that like we're in this situation where the Federal Reserve and the, the government is going to have to continuously, uh, well, maybe not continuously, but every now and then bail out the banks and, you know, we've got to keep try and keep interest rates low, keep the flow of uh, credit going and so and therefore ultimately this is inflationary are we back in because we had a period of very low inflation are we going to be in a period of higher inflation for for longer than we expect is that one of the arguments or well i would a say yeah my conclusion is that we would and it's not a conclusion because it's an ongoing story but but um we're going to be in a period of inflation longer than the you know, the headline news tells us like, you can't just stop inflation. Mm -hmm. Once it starts, it's very hard to stop. And I actually got that quote. I, uh, I interviewed, I did a documentary about 15 years ago and I interviewed Paul Volcker, who was famously the inflation fighter of the early 1980s. He was the fed chair at the time. And what he said to, he said two things that have stuck with me. He said a lot of other things and I published all of what he said, but but he said a couple other things that are two things that have really stuck with me. One, he's like, actually, I'm going to set the stage too. This is after walking past a couple of uh, of cartoon pictures of him that he had framed in his office of him like turning off the inflation spigot, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then another one where he was like wielding a sword and a and a shield, and he was like fighting inflation. So he, he was kind of like a caricature of that time. And that was the worst inflation that the world had seen um, in geez, since the late 1800s, since since the panic of uh, 1893. And 
the reason was we had gotten off the Bretton Woods dollar peg to gold. Da, 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 da. There was like a lot of reasons why it happened. But when I spoke to him, and this is on camera and in the interviews that I published, he said, well, first of all, once inflation gets started, it's very hard to stop because it it creates uh, like a psychosis in people where they start thinking, if I don't spend my money for that refrigerator in June by September, it's going to be 30 bucks more or something like that. And they start thinking like they have to spend their money now. Mm. And that creates uh, inflation psychosis of sorts where people are, are just spending more money more quickly because they think it's going to be worth less later. And you like if the Fed's goal is to slow down the economy, that inflation psychosis works against um, any Fed policy that they can put together. The other thing that he said, which I thought was really interesting, was he did not like everyone the way that the popular media talks about his efforts at the Federal Reserve was that he uh, he raised interest rates to slow inflation. And what he told me, he said, I didn't raise interest rates. I only raised the amount that we were willing to pay on treasuries to fund the government expenses. So like he was working in the mechanism, and this is kind of what Janet Yellen was talking about leading up to this uh, debt ceiling debate, is that the government has obligations and they've already spent the money. They have to pay their bills. If they can't borrow the money by selling bonds in the bond market to fund the government, then they default. And so uh, when Volcker was telling me about it, he was saying that he didn't, he didn't raise rates. He had to offer more money, more return on the treasuries in order to fund the government. Like they get themselves in a bind. Inflation is a killer. And, uh, and I think Powell, in his um, his in the early stages of of combating what we see as rampant inflation, has been trying to avert that. Like there there was the pandemic and there were um, supply chain issues that were also causing price rises. He was trying to avert chasing the the return like what Volcker had to do. So the the short answer to your question is governments learn over time how to combat these issues, but they don't have the answers. Mm. They're just putting in place policies and we read about them and we're like, oh, that's a good one, that's a bad one. We vote politically, we do whatever, but there's no answer to uh, inflation or deflation. Like we don't know how to actually manage the money, but there are people that are, are pointed to positions that put put policies in place and we just have to deal with them. And that's, that's mostly what I do in my writing is I don't take a position. I just try to understand what's happening. So then you can move your money accordingly. But I, there, there's this one situation that appeared uh, in early March, which I just thought was fascinating. A lot of homeowners, me included, had taken advantage of lower mortgage rates we, I, I um, refinance a couple times to get down to like a little, little bit over 2.5, which is like historically low. You could then buy, at, that was in, uh, I think it was probably 2018, the last time I did that, because I was taking advantage of a historically long period of low interest rates. Then when they started hiking um, the Fed fund rate overnight, Treasuries started paying more. So you could actually, if I was borrowing money at like whatever, 3%, I could buy a treasury that was paying 5%. I could just pocket 2% just for buying the treasury. And that mm -hmm. went on. For, there, there was a period of time where the rate was going up. And if I was already borrowing, borrowing money at one level and the rate was going up over here, then it was like, it's like a no-brainer. But yeah. if you don't understand what's happening in the macro picture, and that's why I write these books, yeah, is like you don't even know that those opportunities, you don't know when to buy in at the lowest point, but you also don't know when to buy the treasuries when they're paying higher. 
And that arbitrage right there is in some ways, like especially if the S&P 500 is going down, like that's a good trade. <laughs> so anyway, that's yeah. what I try to do is try to like get people to understand what the macro picture is. And then, and then we issue trades accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, important. This is your research firm, is it, Addison? You, you're advising, you're providing research about where the market. Yeah, we going. have this product yep. that I just started it actually in um, 2020, but it's called the Essential Investor, and it's it's a it's a it's an attempt because I've been in in the publishing business, financial public publishing business for three decades now. I'm trying to address all of the. Um, basic, the essential ideas that investors need to understand the trades that we, that we conduct. Mm. So we put out trades, we have a model portfolio that kind of like explains our investment philosophy, but then we also have uh, two conservative trades per week and one long trade that is um, speculative based on market events that we think are shorter term. So we do that three times a week, but the essential investor itself is really an attempt, like the special report that we're talking about, anatomy of, of a bust, how banks fail. Like we want people to understand like what part of the cycle we're in so that you can invest. We're mostly talking to individual investors. So we want uh, like a base level of knowledge on behalf of the people that are reading our stuff or watching these podcasts or whatever, um, before they make any decisions about their money, because you can make a lot of mistakes. And especially when, <laughs> this is what I was saying before, is that in the boom times, people make a lot of mistakes and you don't even realize it was a mistake until until the bus comes and you're holding assets that are not, not worth what you thought they were going to be. That's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, it happens to everyone. Yeah. So it's good to understand the cycles. Yeah, yeah. Just a couple more questions if you've got time, Addison. I know yeah, yeah, we're yeah. a bit, bit, yeah. over, bit over time. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, oh, just some quick ones first. Essential Investor, was it? Can, yeah. can I find info about that on your website? Can I link to that? Yeah, yeah. It, the best thing to do actually is free. So okay. what you do is go to jointhesessions.com. And that's the Wigan Sessions is my own podcast, and that's mm -hmm. where I get. I would I would invite you to be on, yep. or I'll share this with my with my group. Uh, but then I get all of these people from my network of being in the business for however many years I've been in to come on and talk about spe either specific trades or um, market trends that are, are going to impact um, different areas. We picked assets and we discussed them. I have been big on oil lately for some reason. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we have a number of, of special reports that you can get. Um, the one that I'm offering for free today is Anatomy of Bust, of a Bust, because it explains exactly the ideas and the theory about why the banks are going bust right now. So that's an easy one. And there's a couple of trades in there too. But you can go to jointhesessions.com yep. forward slash EE, because I, I tagged it to your podcast. And then you will get the free report, Anatomy of a Bust. And it also shows you how to sign up for the Wigan Sessions. And then that's a way for us to get the conversation started. And we have a number of other offerings, including uh, Essential Investor after that. An essential investor is really just a community of individual investors who are trying to figure all this stuff out. We've got books in there. Yep. We've got a, a forum to discuss things. People could talk to each other without without me being a moderator or whatever. And then we that's where we post the uh, trades that we put in there. It's entirely an independent, non-institutional community of people trying to manage their own money. It's great. I love it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's great, and that's terrific. And thanks for making that uh, available, Addison. Really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, what about your interviews with Paul Volcker? Are they available online? Can can I watch those? They aren't, so this is just a little weird story, but okay. um, made the in, I made the documentary 
And it was actually very successful. We, I was working with a group from Hollywood. Like I, I went the whole, you know, I thought I was going to be a documentary maker and, and do this whole thing. And I worked with uh, a husband and wife team who were both producer and director. Uh, and it just cost a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of in the hole. And I ended up selling the assets of the documentary, including the uh, interviews, like with Paul Volcker. Um, I sold them to the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, which was founded um, to try to combat uh, growing national debt in the U.S. And like if you go to the Peter G. Peterson found, uh, Foundation, he's got all these resources. And the, the film was kind of about his efforts anyway, because we, I followed um, David Walker, who was the then he was head of the GAO, which is the Government Accountability Office, which is an oxymoron if there ever was one. But he was the head of that. He was like the, the nation's top accountant. And he was going around the country on what he called a fiscal wake up tour. And he was trying to tell people that it's not a good idea for us to go into debt. And we had a bunch of a number of problems that the government just wasn't taking any, you know, paying any attention to. And Peter, Pete Peterson, um, financed the whole project. And then he ended up buying the film for me. And so they own all the assets from that film. But one thing you can do if you want to read the interviews of yeah. Wiley, John Wiley and Sons, who I'm a, I'm been associated with for a number of years, publishes the book version of IOUSA. Okay. It, yeah. It has the the actual transcript from the the um from the documentary, but it also has all of the interviews, even the ones that didn't make it into the um into the movie it's all published in that one one book i will caution though uh what i was freaked out about at the time i made the film from 2006 to 2008 and i was worried that we were going to cross the 10 trillion dollar national debt level <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah okay yeah. <laughs> no. it's kind of dated if you read it but the, the <laughs> logic is the same yeah, it was well, Warren Buffett is in the film, and yeah. we actually did the premiere of the film on August 27th, uh, 22nd, 2008, at the Quest Center, which is where Berkshire Hathaway has their um capitalists. What do they call it? The capital capital con <laughs> every year, Berkshire Hathaway's uh shareholder meeting, mm. and we held it at uh the same place that they do it. And six weeks later, we were I, in the film. I was trying to use the government numbers, and I'm like, in the film, we we're like all panicked because they're going to cross 10 trillion. <laughs> six weeks later, uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and the day after that, that's when Hank Paulson de uh, delivered his three-page bailout plan. And before the end of the fiscal year, which is September 29th of every year, um, we had already gone over 10 trillion so yeah. my movie came dated before i even released it to, to theaters <laughs> and then by the time uh obama became president which was only what three months after that we didn't even know we hadn't had the election yet so we didn't know he was going to be the president but by the time he was sworn in on january 20th uh 2009 we had already crested 11 trillion like the spending rate just took off from there. And now it's like, it only makes me laugh now because I'm like, we're at 31 trillion. What the hell was I worried about at 10? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's right. I mean, it's still high. It's higher now in GDP per terms. I mean, obviously we've had some inflation since no, it's, then. It's so, much higher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. Enough. During that time, we were worried that we would uh, go over 100% of GDP. Mm. And Japan at the time was 130 of GDP. Japan is now like 225 of their own GDP, and we're at like 148. Like mm. that is is just exploding around the world, and we don't have any political means for dealing with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I agree. Yep, yep. 
That's right. Um, okay, just a couple of things because, yeah, it's great conversation. Quickly, yeah. what about crypto? You, you mentioned crypto was part of the story. Uh, people will... Well, I, th- I have a theory about crypto and it's the same thing. And it, it, it's the same philosophy I have about the internet itself is mm-hmm. that we had in 2001, we had a big boom in internet stocks, like even... Uh, even um, uh, to, to draw a blank right now, but the company that makes uh, um, makes insulation for houses was doing fiber optic, and they dropped the dot com on the end of their name. They weren't even a tech company, and they yeah. they exploded in value. Yeah. Wait, what's the pink insulation that we all use? Well, I, I don't even know why I'm drawing a blank on the name, but it's because it's a big uh, insulation company. Anyway. But the point I'm trying to make is that during the dot com boom, there were just ridiculous investment being made, yeah. all kinds of things, and then they busted. But we were in the end, after all the detritus fell to the floor and people sort of like woke up from their hangovers, we ended up with internet and things like Zoom. Like I'm talking to you from Australia right now. I'm in Baltimore, and these things are possible because of that massive. Uh, massive in, uh innovation and the investment that went into that period like that it, it, even um with agora the company i've been working with for a number of years we exploded when we went online and we mm-hmm. benefit greatly from the uh the innovation of email so it changed our lives so i have the same sort of perspective on crypto is that I think it's speculative, and I think there's booms and busts, and we saw that 2018 was crazy. Yeah, and then we saw another spike in in different like Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the stable coins in like 2021. Last year was a nightmare. We called it crypto winter because um, the underpinning. Actually, this is part of the story I'm telling too. Is that two of the stable coins that uh, FTX and Alameda Research were investing in? The traders, they were supposed to be pegged to the US dollar, but the traders unpegged them without telling anyone. And that yeah. started the fight of FTX. Um, so I think you're going to see, I think you're going to continue to see that kind of speculative nature in crypto. And we've got this specter of uh, uh, central bank digital currencies coming up. Like we don't know where that's going to go. Supposedly there's going to be a vote in the US in July on whether the Federal Reserve should adopt one or not. But they keep saying that too. Like that story is going to be ongoing. I think the real benefit of the the innovation and the spikes and the highs and lows and and you know the turbulent market that cryptos has gone through up to this point will ultimately be beneficial because we'll we'll end up with um blockchain as a more efficient way to to conduct transactions in the financial markets. So you can make money, you can lose money in crypto. I'm not a crypto evangelist. Like I believe that it's going to be a substitute to the US dollar or the the world banking system. But Mm -hmm. I do believe the efficiencies that are brought to (laughs) transactions are going to be beneficial to everyone. And that's kind of how I look at it. Even from an investment standpoint, I'm like, Oh, Bitcoin's at fifteen thousand. Maybe I should buy some, and then it's at twenty-seven, and then it's at nine. I'm just like, no, I'm not getting. Somebody tried to buy some property from me a couple of years ago. I think it was in twenty twenty-one, and but they would only do the exchange in uh, in Bitcoin, and I'm like, I don't know if my property is going to be worth less or more if I take your Bitcoin, but I do know what the value of the property is. Yeah. So I think the speculative nature of it is it's too early to to like I, I prefer gold and silver mm. to Bitcoin or Ethereum at the moment. Maybe there's a time when when it makes sense to like use it as a banking tool, but not right now. Too speculative for me. And yep. uh but I do think that the benefits of blockchain are going to be like email to us, you know, a couple of years from now where everyone's going to be using blockchain for efficiency, which I think is great. Mm, yeah, that is, 
in the boom bust cycle, that's what happens. People invest a lot of money quickly into innovative projects and a lot of people get burnt. A lot of people get rich. And then what we end up with is the, the core technology that benefits humanity as a whole. I mean, I, I love technology. Yeah. 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 I'm just on the, the yeah, just uh, one thing I, I wanted to cover too, is this demise of the dollar you talk about. So is that a, is this this is a long run concern of yours about where the US dollar is going? And I mean, this is related yeah. to the points you're making I mean, about banking. Yeah, the thing is, like I, I mean, I could flip through the book. There's a one great chart that shows what has happened to the dollar. I'm not going to be able to find it and make it make sense to your viewers, but um, since the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913, to um, the, the original goal of the central bank was to stabilize the currency and maintain its purchasing power in the economy for payment currency users like me. Mm. <laughs> like it's supposed to be able to, I'm supposed to be able to figure out what my dollar can buy and for how long. Um, but it's lost more than 97% of its purchasing power since. Um, 1913 and it's it's a steady slope downward the more money they pour into the system the like every dollar that you print becomes worth less than the one that was printed last and uh the entire banking system of the world is dependent on the dollar as a reserve currency um and at the same time we're losing our the value of its purchasing power uh every day and it's been going on for more than a century their their main task was to preserve the purchasing power of the currency that we use in the payment system in the economy and they have done anything but that and it's it could be it's historic mm. fiat currencies never work it accelerated after 1971 when the Bretton Woods system fell apart the only thing you can do is understand it and then try to move your money around into assets that that, that accumulate value over time. That's why I like gold and silver because yeah. there's a little bit more speculative. But gold, when we when I was younger and uh, first trying to understand how these things correlate, gold was trading at like 253 bucks an ounce in 1999, I think, and now it's trading on average a little bit above 2,000. Over that time, the S and P 500, it's outpaced the S and P 500, which is the broadest measure of big stocks. Um, it's just been a better investment over time, and that's that's just generally what I think is it's a reverse correlation to um, the dollar, which is supposed to be managed <laughs> by the bankers who keep sort of forgetting about risk and inflation and those kinds of things. <laughs> right. On. Okay, might have to. Come back to fiat currencies. Yeah, it's a big, big topic, but another time because uh, I've, I've really uh, picked your brain and it's been great. Yeah, it's fine. I don't mind. That's okay. Yeah, well, very good. Uh, that's great. Uh, and yeah, maybe if you would, if you wanted to sum up your, I mean, broadly the anatomy of a bust. Uh, would you like to summarize it, or do, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Just, just no, I mean, I would just say that it, it was my attempt when when I was already following the story of FTX, and I knew there was going to be a knock-on effect. And I had, starting in about December of 2022, so like six months ago, I was like, this story is not going to go away. And there's going to be a knock-on effect in other parts of the market that we're not aware of right now. Now that was in December, and then by March we we started having banks fail, which nobody thought was even possible anymore, with the Federal Reserve system and um, the FDIC backing out small depositors. Like nobody thought we would have bank runs ever again, and and then we had the three largest ones within a six week period. So I had already been kind of following the story and trying to just trying to understand how it would even be possible. So that's what's in the report is like, here's what happened. Here's why it happened. Um, here's what you need to pay attention to. And here's how it fits into the historical perspective of 
booms and busts. The credit cycle is a real thing, even if the government is trying to mitigate it. Mm. It it does exist and it impacts everyone because you need a bank to save your money, to borrow, to do things that you want to do, to run your business. You need you need a bank that works with you. And if they're making dumb choices with the assets that they have, um, it's better to know that in advance. So that's what the report is about. And then there's a couple of recommendations on uh, investment investments you can make um, in in once you understand what's going on. We actually gotcha. recommend the bank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is for U.S. banks. Um, might have to have a. I'll have to have a. I'll have to have a. Uh, conversation i don't know if you look at australian banks if that's something you i don't i haven't know. looked at australian banks except for uh in the macro sense where i'm aware that the federal reserve decisions to move rates also has a knock-on effect in australia mm. new zealand um, china and japan and europe those are like the big ones Russia yeah. was part of that too until they uh, decided to destroy their neighbors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the general view here is that our our banks are in a much better position than uh, than you. Yeah, it, banks. that could be. Yeah. I haven't yeah. studied them yeah. closely enough to know. I yeah, think but, the reserve requirements are different in Australia than in the U.S. too. Mm, yeah, yeah. There there are definitely differences. So um, yeah, I might have to. I'll have a close look at that myself. But uh, I'll look at it. And it's been terrific. I've spent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, probably more time than you, you may have uh, expected yeah, uh, delved we, into we it because to I think what's great is you you do deep research and you make uh yeah you make uh, I don't know big calls I suppose or you make uh yeah you make you really let us know what you think and I think it's great and uh yeah it's it makes me think about what's going on so uh, much more so really appreciate all the work you do and i'll put links in the show notes to uh, to you, to your work and and thanks for Great. making that uh, that report available for listeners that's terrific so yeah um, absolutely i it's information that i like i would just caution people that i'm learning about it as fast as i can but i'm also passionate about it that's why i do it um this whole project that i have the wigan sessions is a passion project. I like talking about this stuff. <laughs> and then it, it makes me think just like you're saying, it makes you think. And, uh, and I want to give away the report just to, to spread what I've learned, because I think it's important stuff for, especially if you're trying to manage your own money, it's really important for you to understand the bigger trends. And I, you know, I have a philosophy degree and I studied literature at school and stuff. So I'm interested in the stories of what's going on. Uh, and it, it's, it might sound perverse, but I was actually excited when we started having our own banking crisis. Because oh. I'm like, holy shit, it's happening right in front of my face. I just have to read the news. Uh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Get, get the report. It's, it's interesting and uh, it's helpful to like, make sense of what's happening in the news too. Yeah, yeah. Certainly I guess it, it could be exciting, stressful. I remember being in Treasury and here in Australia during our well, the financial crisis, we didn't have it as bad as it was in the States, but it was still quite uh quite stressful uh at a time when we started seeing the the drop in government revenues and the need yeah, to right. borrow lots more money. And yeah, there Well was... my biggest concern, I put this in the report too, but my biggest concern right now is we were talking about the savings rate during the pandemic. I think the same thing happened in Australia too. The mm. savings rate was high because there was a lot of government stimulus, like direct payments to citizens. So the savings rate, and then nobody could go anywhere. So the savings rate went really high. It actually peaked above uh, consumer credit for like a you know like maybe a month, and then as the economy started uh, opening up and people started traveling and like making decisions like, oh, we're free, we can go do what we want, the savings rate plummeted. And then the consumer credit rate for all of the things, so I'm only talking about the US, but I'm sure it's mimicked in other Western economies. The consumer credit rate skyrocketed before the Fed started raising rates. So like all these people are taking on uh, adjustable rate credit cards and loans and, and uh, mortgages and things. And then suddenly the the debt service that they have to pay on on those rates went through the roof. 
it's tripled. So you had a plummeting savings mm-hmm. rate at the same time that you have a um, that a, a service to debt ratio going through the roof. It's not a good scenario, and we haven't even really seen that impact on like earnings in the S and P five hundred, the big retailers and stuff like that. We haven't seen what that impact is going to look like yet. So that's wow. my kind of my biggest yeah. Learn, other than the banks themselves, because mm-hmm. they didn't calculate for it, there's two kind of points there that I'm keeping an eye on. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Well, definitely, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it too. I think they're really good points. Okay, Addison Wigan, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed that. That was yeah, terrific. yeah, James, uh, good to talk to you, man. Very good. Thanks, Addison. Yeah, yeah. we'll talk to you soon.